All right, so what's up, everybody? Yeah, I figured today we'd start off with y'all just working out this problem and seeing what you come up with. This was the problem we ended class on in last class. So what do we think? Do we know how to do it? All right. So looking at this problem, first thing we need to remember is that we're going to be applying the chain rule, right? And that each of these y cubes, y squared, five y's, they're going to act like their own sort of u value, right? So when we do the derivative on them, when we apply the derivative to them, we're going to have du dy dy dx right so what this will look like then it's going to be d dx applied to y cubed plus y squared minus 5y is it minus yep minus x squared is equal to well, the derivative of a constant, this is going to be zero, right? So this is all going to come out to be equal to zero. Excuse me. And like I said, each of these are going to play the role of their own sort of u value. Right? So when we apply the sum and difference property or rule and distribute this derivative all the way through, what we're going to get is dx of y cubed plus d dx of y squared plus d dx, by mistake, minus of 5y minus the derivative of x squared is going to be 2x. All of this is equal to 0. Well, this thing, this is like taking d du, or my mistake, d dx, 
of u1 as a function of y, right? Everybody agree with this? So what this will come out to be then is d dy of u times dy dx. Make sense? So doing that really quick, we're going to get 3y squared dy dx plus 2y dy dx minus 5 dy dx minus 2x is equal to zero. Well, hey, we can factor out now all these dy dx's. And we can go ahead and move this 2x to the other side, right? This negative 2x. So when we do that, we're going to get the quantity 3y squared plus 2y minus 5 times dy dx is equal to 2x. All I did here was factor out this dy dx and move 2x to the other side, right? So all of this combined, what it's telling us now is that we can divide out this polynomial from both sides to isolate dy dx. To get that dy dx is equal to 2x over 3y squared plus 2y minus 5. Is everybody with me on this? People at home, is this making sense? People at home, I'm taking off points without comments. Is this making sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, awesome. Makes sense. No. Sweet. All right. So, really quickly, what did we just find? We found the derivative of this crazy ass equation. We found dy dx of this crazy ass equation. Now, in such a way that now we can actually go ahead and find out what the tangent line is at any given point of this equation, right? Because dy dx is equal to the slope of the tangent line. So looking at the process really quick, they do more or less the same thing, right? They apply the derivative to both sides. Well, the derivative of a constant, that's just zero. Then they go through and they apply implicit differentiation after the sum and difference rule. Then they move 2x to the other side. Then they factor out that dy dx. And then they divide both sides by your crazy polynomial. So if we want to find dy dx at any given point here now, we need the actual point value. We need the x and the y. In this case, at the point 1, negative 3, we plug in 1 for x, negative 3 for our y's. It would calculate the derivative that way. Is this cool with everyone? 
Those. All right, so. In this case, we're just going to find the slope at the point one, one. Does anybody know what this equation provides? Like what, what the graph of this equation looks like? Not quite. Looks like an hourglass sort of, right? All right, so what we want to do now, we want to find dy dx of this equation at the point one one. dx of the entire thing, 2x squared minus y squared is equal to ddx of 1 this is going to get 0 over here we're going to get d dx of 2x squared minus d dx of y squared So now we're going to have 4x, right, minus du dy times dy dx is equal to 0. Well, what is this u? This u is equal to y squared. So du dy is going to equal to 2y. Everybody agree with me on this? So now we've got 4x minus 2y dy dx is equal to 0. We can subtract 4x from both sides and then divide out the negative 2y. Agreed? So now we're going to divide out negative 2y from both sides to isolate dy dx. Which is negative 4x over negative 2y or 2x over y. And at the point one, one, that's going to come out to be just two, right? Because when X is equal to one and Y is equal to one, we're just going to have two times one over one. So just two. How's this spell to everyone?
So the trick to all of this is recognizing that there's an intermediate step that will help with what you're doing. Taking the time to identify a you will help because it'll let you see better how to apply the chain rule. And then once you have that figured out, from there, it's just pretty much straight algebra. Once you've done the calculus, right? It's just algebra from that point on. So jumping to the next slide. Going into the process, same idea. They get to 2x over y, plugging in the point. They get that the derivative at 1, 1 is equal to 2. They also go a little bit further to the extra to explain that this graph is called a hyperbola. Curious who names these, right? Like hyperbola, parabola. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, checking out a more business oriented question. We've got this demand function. So price is a function of demand, right? The number of units being sold. And what we're asked to do is to find the rate of change of demand X with respect to P when X is equal to 100. So what does that mean we need to do? What's happening here? What do you all think? What's the first step that's going to happen? Well, I'm going to flip ahead. The first thing is you want to get these X's out of the denominator and up top, right? The next step, which you don't necessarily have to do. Um, in fact, I would not myself. Um, is to go ahead and divide out that P from both sides. I wouldn't do that, but they do. Um, now I see why they do it. Having said that, let's work this out by hand on the board, just so that we can see all the nuances that are happening here. The first thing, like I said, is to get these X's up top away from everything else. And the reason why is because with them down here, we're going to get this really weird quotient rule thing going on, right? Like, how are we going to actually apply the derivative to that? It's, it's going to be a mess. So getting it out of that denominator and isolating P on the opposite side, what we're going to do so we're going to say that is what 0. 0.000. How many zeros is that? Five. Five. All right. Point zero 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 three. To or one times x to the third plus zero point zero one times x plus one is equal to three over P. Again, they do this to isolate the P. Now what they're asking for is the derivative of demand as a function of price, right? 
So they're asking for dx dp. That's the question here, right? Which is a pretty understandable question if you're running a business. You want to know how the price is going to impact your demand, right? So applying everything here, what we're going to do first is identify the fact that these These two terms are acting the role of different U's, right? This is like U1 as a function of X. This is like U2 as a function of X. So applying the derivative, to both sides, We apply it to this. This is going to come out to be d dx of u1 dx dp. And this is going to come out to be d dx of u2 times dx dp. So doing all of this now, we're going to have 0 0.0000003 x squared dx dp plus 0 0.01 dx dp is equal to negative 3 over p squared, right? Everybody agree with this so far? Because the derivative of 1 goes to 0, so we really have this hidden plus 0 over here, but adding 0, just go ahead and throw it out. So now, factoring out the dx dps, we have 0 0.0000003 x squared plus 0 0.01 times dx dp is equal to negative 3 over p squared. Now divide out the polynomial. You get dx dp is equal to negative 3 over p squared times 0 0.0000003 x squared plus 0 0.01. Comparing. dx dp, right? Now, notice what they've done here is they went ahead and solved for what p is when x is 100, right? They said, hey, it's $1. So since we're interested 
in this equation, whenever x is equal to 100, we just saw it for p, plug that in, and now we can plug in 100 into our derivative to find out what the rate of change is. Does this make sense to everybody? No. Yeah. Who came up with these decimal problems? All right, cool. So, section 2.8. Oh, before I forget, and before we go any further, there is a question of the week posted. Everybody at home, there's a question of the week posted. Let me say it again for everybody. There's a question of the week posted. It's due in a couple of days. Um, also, the second exam won't be for another couple of weeks. I checked the syllabus. I thought it was after this chapter. It's after, it's after chapter three. Um, so I think that puts it in three weeks. Everybody cool with that? Do you have, did you tell us last week that the exam happened? I did not, but it is the, the statistics you can see on Blackboard. Oh, okay. So I made it available to everyone to see what the average of the class was. Um, I think in both classes, it was around an 80%, I think. I won't swear to that. That might have been after I took out outliers from people who have dropped the class and all. Um, but anyhow, having said that, section 2.8. Section 2.8 is all about rates of change. Rates of change are all about the chain rule. and relating different concepts together, right? So so let's say we've got a funnel. We're filling it up with water. I'm going to draw a nice little spigot. Right? A nice little cone with some water in it. As this flows, as we're pouring water into this cone, how fast does this rise up? If we know that the rate with which we're adding water is dBdt, What's dH dt? Give it a couple other things. For example, what the radius of the cone is and what the height of the cone is compared to that radius. Once we know all these details, this is an perfect classic example of a rate of change problem. I hope I kept it in the slide. I did not. Okay. So what rates of change allow us to do, like I said, is to connect the way things change together. Um, for example, let's consider this problem here. The variables X and Y are differentiable functions of T and are related by the equation y is equal to x squared plus 3. So what we're saying is that really this thing is y of t is equal to x of t squared plus 3. We want to know when x is equal to 1, and dx dt is equal to 2, we want to know what dy dt is, given that x is equal to 1. 
So to go through how these problems work, first thing we want to do, apply DDT to both sides. We want to differentiate with respect to T. So we end up with dy dt. That makes sense because this is playing the role of u, right? So we get dy dt is equal to 2x plus dx dt. This makes sense again because what, uh, x squared is playing the role of u again. So differentiating with respect to x and then with respect to t. So what I'm saying is this thing acts like u as a function of y. This thing acts like u as a function of x. So when we differentiate what we're going to get is d dy of u times d dt dy dt, right? Well, check it out. If u is just equal to y, du dy is going to come out to be 1. dy dt, well, y is implicitly described as a function of t, so it's going to be left as dy dt. And what we're going to get then is this thing is going to give us just dy dt, right? This thing is going to give us 2x dx dt. And then we're adding three. The derivative of that is just going to be zero. So plus zero. Go ahead and ignore it. Okay. So from here, we're given the two points of information that x is equal to one, dx dt is equal to two. So we can plug that in. just to compare with what we were given, right? When x is equal to 1, dx dt is equal to 2. We're trying to find it when x is equal to 1, right? We're trying to find dy dt when x is equal to 1. So plug all of this in. sense to everybody. So really it's just the chain rule but in a special way now. Like we're just playing with the same idea. We're saying hey this thing's a function of t, this thing's a function of t. How do these rates relate to each other? Does this make sense to everybody? Yeah. Another way to think of this is to say, let's say I have two functions.
If we know, if we know how y and x relate to each other, and we calculate the way x behaves, the, the change in the behavior of x at a particular point, then we can go ahead and say, hey, since x relates to y in a particular way, it makes sense then that the change in x will relate to the change in y in a particular way. And this is what we can do from here. Does that make sense what I mean? Yeah? Kind of, sort of? Cool. All right, so the general process is going to be such. Given the equation and given this information, we're going to want to find dy dt whenever x is equal to 1, right? So let's go ahead and set up the relationship between dx dt and uh, dy dt by applying the derivatives. Yeah. And then using that, plug in the given information about the rate of changes. Does this make sense what I mean? All right, so we've got this pebble dropped into a, a puddle of water, pond of water, pool of water, whatever. It's, it's water. A body of water. We're going to drop this pebble into it. It's going to form ripples in our little circles, in our traditional concentric circles, right? We know the radius of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. So let me draw another circle. The rate of change is one foot per second in the radius of this outer circle. When the radius is four feet, what's the total area going to be? What's the rate of change? So how are we gonna do this problem? Well, let me ask a question. What we've got set up right now is dr dt is equal to 1. And we're asking the question, what is dA dt when r is equal to 4, right? Is there a way we can relate a and r together, our area and our radius? What's the area of a circle? Area of a circle is pi r squared, right? So we know that a is equal to pi r squared. Now checking out what we really got here 
is A, is a function of time, is related to pi times R as a function of time squared, right? So if we differentiate both sides of this with respect to time, we're going to get d dt of a is equal to pi times 2r dr dt. Agreed? Well, we're told that dr dt is a constant. Right? It's just one. And we want to find out what da dt is when r is equal to 4. So all we've got to do here plug in everything we know. Pi is pi, two times, well, we're calculating what r is equal to four, and we know dr dt is a constant, it's just equal to one. So to do all of this, this calculation is going to come out to be a pi, right? Make sense what I mean? Yeah. So, the equation that relates R and A together is just the area of a circle. We're given that the rate of change of the radius with respect to time is just one, and that the radius is going to be equal to four. So, da dt is equal to pi times 2r dr dt. Just do an implicit differentiation for the chain rule, right? And we plug in everything we know. These problems generally look scarier than what they actually are. And the hard part is always the setup. Having said that, don't overthink it. Don't let yourself overthink these problems because these are going to be really easy to overthink. Like looking at this, it's pretty straightforward once you see it all, right? But the big jump here was questioning whether or not a is equal to pi r squared, right? Like that's where we're all like, okay, do I just use that? Like, is it that simple, right? Yeah, so you do. You make sure you know how these things are related to each other. Once you do, once you set up the initial relation, you apply the derivative, put it through the chain rule, and you throw in your known information. And out comes your answer. Don't let yourself second guess these problems. Um, that is honestly, in my experience, the biggest hurdle with these is just second guessing oneself. Um, so, general good tactics just identify everything you know. In the same way, I drew out the pictures to kind of pull aside what we knew, right? Like, we know we're talking about the radius r. We know that the change in r with respect to time is one foot. We know that the area is related to r in a particular way. Write all this out. Then start organizing your thoughts by writing an equation that relates everything. Then use a chain rule. Then take everything you know that's off to the side and throw it in. So as an example, pumping up a balloon. 
The biggest hurdle here is going to be how does the volume of a balloon and the radius of a balloon relate to each other? They relate as V is equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Then making sure you know what all you're going to be asking for. You're going to be solving for the change and radius with respect to time in this problem. You're going to be given the rate at which volume changes with respect to time. And you're going to want to find dr dt when r is equal to 2. So starting with our initial equation, d is equal to 4 over 3 times pi r cubed. We're going to differentiate both sides with respect to t. Apply the chain rule. We get this crazy, ugly looking thing down here. But check it out. We know 2 is what r is going to be equal to. We know 4.5 is what dv dt is going to be equal to. So we can throw all of that together and solve for what dr dt is given these particular circumstances. Again, the setup is the hardest part of this. It really, truly is. Um, yeah. Having said that, I'm gonna let y'all try this for a second. First thing we're going to do is apply chain rule, right? Yep. Apply the derivative to both sides and use the chain rule. When we do that, we're going to get dp dt is equal to 500 times dx dt minus 2x over 4 dx dt. Yeah? Why does that say dx 
It doesn't. So from here, we're going to want to factor out the dx dt, right? do that just because it's going to make the math easier for ourselves. Now, in this problem, we're given that dx dt is equal to 10. And what we're curious about is dp dt at x equal to 500. So we're going to throw in 500, we're going to throw in 10. It's going to come out to be 250, right? 500 minus 250 is going to be just 250 times 10. It's going to be 2,500. Everybody at home, what do you think? Everybody at home, what do you think? Everybody at home, 10 points are being lost for every second you sleep. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Well, jumping ahead. Since we've lost everybody at home. Um, just comparing how everything's done. We're given the profit model, right? We differentiate both sides with respect to time and apply the chain rule. We're given that dx dt is equal to 10, and that we, what we're trying to solve for is when x is equal to 500, right? We plug all that in, and we find that dp dt is equal to 2,500. So another similar problem, this company is increasing the production of a product at the rate of 200 units per week. So 
derivative that we probably are going to want to write down. So we're told later in the problem that X is the number of units produced in a week. And we're told at the very beginning that the rate of production is 200 units per week. DX DT is equal to 200. The weekly demand function is modeled by P is equal to 100 minus 0 0.001 X, where P is the price, X is the number of units produced in a week. Find the rate of change of the revenue with respect to time, when the weekly production unit of production is 200 units. So we want price per unit. So DP DT at X equal to 2,000. Anything else we need to do here? Anything else we need to collect in this problem? From here, I want to apply the derivative to both sides, right? Applying the derivative to both sides, we're going to get dp dt is equal to negative 0 0.001 dx dt. So we should just be able to plug dx dt in, right? Not quite. Because what we didn't do is calculate what the actual revenue function was. We just worked with the price function, right? The revenue function is going to be the price times x. Make sense what I mean? So using that, R is going to be equal to X times P, which is equal to X times 100, or 100 times X, minus 0 0.001 X squared. And now we're going to go through and solve all of this. All right. So why is this? Again, because what this is modeling is the price. What we're asking about is the change in revenue. Revenue is going to be the number of products you're selling. So it'll be X times P. Does that make sense what I mean? Yep. 
So dr dt is equal to 100 dx dt minus 0 0.001, my mistake, 2 times x dx dt. We can factor out that dx dt. Now we can throw everything together. Moral of the story here is details matter. What was important was to know that the equation given wasn't the equation we were trying to, to do the operations on, right? It was only part of the story. Does this make sense what I mean? So making sure we know exactly what we're asking is another big part of that hurdle. And that's why writing everything down off to the side while you're doing these problems is such a good idea. It lets you kind of backtrack that thought process. And having said that, I will let you all out 13 minutes early today because I am out of slides, I think. Yeah, that's the end of them. Um, I'll stick around if you all have any other questions. Yep, here you go. Yeah. Yep.